I want, to, I want to welcome all of you and thank you for coming to the Engineering Distinguished Lecture. This is the first year of the Engineering uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. And this is the first hosted by the School of Industrial Engineering. So I'm delighted to welcome all of you. And at this point, I'd like to welcome our dean, uh, Dean Meng Chang, uh, the John A. Edwardson Dean of the College of Engineering. Um, he was uh, winner of the Waterman Award in uh, 2013. Uh, his uh, courses have been taken by more than 250,000 students. Um, he's written several books uh, and also started several companies and a nonprofit consortium. So, Professor. Well, thank you, Abhi. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the uh, fourth um, Distinguished Lecture series of Purdue Engineering. Uh, we are delighted with the inaugural uh, cohort of uh, five outstanding lectures. Uh, today is the fourth one uh, for sparing time from their very busy uh, intellectual life to uh, come share their thoughts with us at Purdue Engineering. And today, uh, uh, I'm personally uh, so delighted and excited to welcome Eva Tadosh from Cornell because uh, I've been following uh, Eva's uh, work uh, for many, many years myself. Uh, and um, well, <laughs> Eva really needs no introduction, but nonetheless, uh, uh, Professor Tadosh is the Jacob Gold Sherman Professor of Computer Science at Cornell uh, and was the chair of the department from 06 to 2010. Uh, she uh, came from university uh, in Budapest and uh, joined Cornell in 89. Uh, as we all know that uh, uh, Professor Tadash uh, made a pioneering and fundamental contributions to a wide range of topics, uh, including approximation algorithms, uh, selfish routings, efficiency, network flow algorithms, among many others. And uh, Professor Tadash is one of the a few who are elected to both National Academy of Engineering and a National Academy of Sciences. Uh, she's also a member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences as an external member and a member of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, I could only read a subset of the many distinguished awards she has received, including the Gerdo Prize, Danzig Prize, Falkerson Prize, and IEEE Technical Achievement Award. She's also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of ACM. Uh, the list goes on and on, but we're all very eager to hear learning and efficiency of outcomes in games from Professor Tadosh. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you. Oh, I have to hold that. Oops. Uh, so thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to uh, tell you all a little bit about the area that I currently find very exciting for research. Um, I guess there's a bunch of words in my title that maybe I'll come to explain in a second, and a bunch of co-authors listed on my slide that I'll maybe emphasize as we get there, but this is work that I have done over the last uh, number of years, including a bunch of number of my students, uh, maybe the one I would promote the most by this work. Second is the one I listed first, Todoris Licoris, who will be on the job market next year. So <laughs> if you guys are interested, this is a great student to possibly hire. So I'm going to be interested in large population repeated games. So there are two words here. One is the game, and second is there's something, uh, two different senses, it's a large game. I guess one example of this large game is traffic routing, and with these two schematic pictures, I want to suggest uh, this could either be packet traffic or car traffic, it's depending whether you want a computer science -y or a more uh, civil engineering -y application for traffic routing. What I mean here is that individual packets or individual cars have a source and a destination. They want to go between the source and the destination, and in this particular version, they want to avoid congestion that they you know, get faster to destination or less likely to get dropped uh, on the way to the destination if there's not so many other cars or packets going on the very same path. Um, I can think of this as a centralized optimization problem where you would want to get all the cars to their destination as fast as possible, but instead I want to think of this as a game on which every packet, think of it as a car driver or uh, a owner of one of those packets, um, 
want to get to the destination, and you don't that much care what the hell happens to the other cars, as long as your car gets to the destination very fast. Uh, this is a game because as a car driver, you're both optimizing your op opti objective function, but at the same time, you're causing an effect on the other people. In particular, you're causing congestion on the road that's not so good for the other people driving on the very same roads. Uh, what I'm going to sort of the most recent work or the work that I'm going to emphasize at the um, end or last piece of my talk, I want to especially make this more realistic uh, in this driving example or packet routing example. Uh, you want to think about what happens as people repeat this exercise of routing packets or routing cars over and over again, but Maybe it's not exactly the same traffic. If I think of internet packet traffic, you know, maybe you want to read the New York Times, you get a lot of packets from wherever you, your New York Times um, text originates from, and then you got bored, you read all the articles, and you go and read something else, or actually you go home and stop reading, and someone else reads the New York Times instead. So packet traffic or car traffic as the same, same story is not completely stable. There's some amount of predictability. We don't usually want a single packet. We want the whole article from the New York Times. And similarly, lots of the car traffic has the extremes of cars going from you know, typical home destinations to typical uh, original destinations. There's a, a fair amount of traffic. This is what I'm going to call a repeated game. It's repeated because every single minute or every single hour, there are new cars driving. A different application that I was thinking slightly mixing in in, in the talk is one where instead of uh, we're driving or writing packets to avoid congestion, there's something uh, that's more a sort of auctiony or uh, auction-based application is advertising auction. So as you guys might all know, uh, we get a lot of things in the internet, quote, for free. And what we're really doing is paying it, paying it with watching advertisement. And in particular, there is a very uh, vibrant and interesting area of how to best sell advertisement. There are a lot of interesting aspects there, including how to do this to actually feel like you're not bothered, but at the same time, you are buying stuff they're advertising. But one way to think of this, again, is a repeated game. Advertisements on the internet, say next to Google, are fractions of cents what one of those things costs. So it's not that any advertisement is particularly expensive or painful, but instead, the volume of advertisement is so high that the whole industry, in fact, the very rich industry, is living on this. So this is millions of dollars, fraction of a cent at a time. Uh, definitely a repeated game in a sense that every single second, multiple ad opportunities show up and advertisements happen, come and go. And again, just like in the previous case, it's not quite the same thing every single second. Other things change in the world. The something comes out in the news, and that affects of what's popular and not popular, and other things of that form change. So I would want to think of this as a model of a repeated game, and I wanted to maybe start telling you what I mean by repeated game is a bit more abstract setting. So what this picture tries to illustrate is times going from, um, sorry, left to right. And in the first time period, everyone does something, and then you know something happens, and then time, time goes on, and they, different things happen to them. As a mathematical model of what I want to think about, um, the the players here, the participants, either the routers or the advertisers or Google, as the case may be, I will assume they have some sort of value or cost associated with the outcome. So they either trying to minimize delay or they're trying to maximize value or maximize utility or some other goal like this. And the assumption I'm going to make for most of the talk, though I'm going to actually send a little uh, pre um, sort of what, what might be classical other options, is that what people are doing in this situation is learning from data. So one thing that changed, or one thing that's prevalent in this class of applications because of the repetition of these actions over and over again, 
that as you participate in this interaction, you have an enormous resource of an enormous amount of data from your past interactions. So going back to the advertisement auction, even if you just participate in ad auctions for a couple of days, that's incredible amount of data that's right at your hand of what happened or could have happened during those couple of days. If you're Google and have a couple of days of data from Google of how much uh, everyone wants to pay for the ad, that's an incredible amount of data uh, rich for learning from. And the same thing sort of happens in traffic routing, though maybe that's more engineered. Um, in the car traffic version, I guess you have to listen to the news to get better information. In packet traffic, uh, they're trying to ping different destinations to figure out uh, you know, how congestion is at different various places. Uh, there may be one has to be a little bit careful of how much information they're getting. Uh, but again, it's a repeated game where past data of what happened in the last 10 minutes, what happened during the last, year, last uh, week is definitely useful. And I'm going to take the attitude that everyone is learning from data. What I'm going to ask is if everyone is learning from data, or if most people are learning from data, what can we say about the system performance? That's sort of my basic question. And then as a follow-up question, if I worry about that the traffic might not be totally stable here, that situation might change, I also want to know that if I can maybe prove, and that's what I want to try to argue, that good things will happen if everyone's learning, how long do they have to be around to make sure we learned enough? If everything is super super changeable, and every 10 seconds, humanity becomes a whole other humanity who behaves totally differently than 10 seconds ago, then probably we can't learn. There's not enough data about us around. But if we're somewhat more stable than we can, and it's interesting to quantify how stable things have to be for learning to start working well. So that's sort of the high level question of what I want to ask. I guess I should have said in the beginning, uh, I will start uh, by giving you some examples of what games and learning means and what the classical solutions before thinking about what learning would mean in this context. Uh, but if there are any questions any moment, feel free to uh, ask. And actually, those of you standing back there, there are empty seats here if you're willing to come down. Um, OK, so examples. So maybe the, the traffic routing is always the easiest as an example to think about. And while I somewhat alternate in, in the applications I talk about between the auctions and when you want to buy something versus traffic routing, traffic routing is an example that everyone easily can associate with, if not because of internet traffic, then because we all drive our cars. And therefore, it's a natural example. So here is the traffic routing as a very, very simple, basic example. So the assumption is that the amount, it, uh, the, num the, the time it takes to get through a certain edge in this example has something to do with the congestion on the edge. So I gave you a super simple example here uh, where either it's a fixed amount of time. So on top, I guess this is not working well. Uh, takes one hour to travel on an edge, and then two other edges that are more congestion sensitive. If there's X amount of traffic, it maybe takes X over 100 amount of time. And I offered you a particular solution here where the traffic were to split 50-50 between two uh, upper pass and lower pass. Now, one disturbing edge, there is this really super fast zero minute edge connecting the two edges, which at the moment we're not using, I would notice that the amount of time to get through this network is an hour and a half. Half an hour because x is 50, 50 over 100 is a half, plus an hour on both edges. However, this is not a game theoretically or selfishly sustainable solution. That is, it's not a Nash equilibrium for a very simple reason of that zero cost edge because there is this pass over there. If I'm one of those 100 drivers, I would think, wait, 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 I have a much better solution. If I follow that red dotted pass, I get half plus zero plus another half. That's only an R. And if they all do this, 
So that says this is not an equilibrium, or not the Nash equilibrium as it's called. And if they all do this, we are definitely all in trouble. We all follow this, every, all 100 of us. Then x, unfortunately, went up to 100. And 100 plus 0 plus 100, that's not taking two hours. So what happened here is uh, we all worse off, because we all behaved selfishly. Now, if you have seen this example, maybe you're uh, more familiar with the whole thinking. I guess let me point out some basic fact for anyone who hasn't seen the example. Uh, this is a Nash equilibrium. You might wish to go back to the previous situation, but solely alone you cannot. The trouble is the other guys are doing this. If you were to follow the upper pass as you used to, that now also is takes two hours. So you really can't help. There is nothing you can do. In fact, this is the unique Nash equilibrium. This is a Nash equilibrium. You can't help it. This is the delay you get. And this is the unique Nash equilibrium. And what really happened here from just driving home the game theoretic aspect, that while I was selfishly optimizing for myself, I caused trouble to 99 other people. And cumulatively, the pain I caused to 99 other people was bigger the advantage I got myself. So, you know, cumulatively, all 99 other people caused pain to me, and we all were soft. Um, this is the example. This, is, this example was originally discovered by Bries, a German uh, scientist, mathematician. And uh, I think this is definitely an example that got me interested in the area. And the very first thing that I started to work on, and maybe what of all the work got mentioned, what I'm most known for is the following theorem that says that in some way this equilibrium, let's go back to this, is not quite as bad as it seems. Yes, two hours is more than an hour and a half, but if you think about it in the traffic routing in internet packet routing and not car driving, you know, packets come pretty fast, so we're talking about two seconds versus one and a half seconds. Maybe that doesn't make such a big difference. Or maybe it does, but not infinitely bad. And in fact, we actually proved a, a theorem that I kind of still very much like, saying that if you, if you cheat a little bit, and instead of comparing your solution, which is on the left, the cost or the total delay in a Nash equilibrium, not compared to the optimum, which indeed was better, but compared to an optimum that has to carry higher amount of traffic saying, maybe in plain English, that if you design your network to be capable of carrying more traffic than you're going to have, then letting people selfishly drive wherever they want is OK. That's what this really says, which is a nice uh, justification or, or thinking of something that the internet providers all do. If you have a problem, don't control the traffic. Just put more capacity in. Um, so that is design the network to carry more traffic. But where this, this, this was the early years of an area of thinking of outcomes in games and the classical notion that we started, to, many of us started to think about it and got dubbed the price of energy, is thinking about this ratio of how much damage do I cause in the Nash equilibrium, uh, the ratio of cost of the Nash equilibrium compared to a socially designed optimal cost. If I go back to my Brace Paradox example, it was two over one and a half. That is, it turns out that one and a half is actually the optimum. To be more honest, I guess there are really two definitions I should be careful with. This ratio only makes sense if it's all pure cost or all pure utility. And I actually have like two definitions up here to make sure the price of energy is always above one. It's a bad thing if it's big. So it's either the cost of the Nash versus optimum, or in case of a utility question where we're not reaching as high utility as I should, I reverse the ratio to keep it above one. This, note, this definition was first proposed by Kutsupias and Papadimitriou a couple of years before our paper, uh, and really took off since. And uh, there were a beautiful set of many great results. Uh, some of them are traffic routing based, like understanding this price of energy in um, lots and lots of different uh, congestion or traffic routing games, and also lots and lots and lots of auctions. That is, first price auction, second price auction, multiple prices, 
uh, public good action, variations of every particular action type you know. Uh, some are better than others, as we now know, but we have a pretty good understanding of what is this price of energy. Uh, I'll come back a little bit of how we prove this, uh, because it will be useful, or maybe, I, in fact, I have a next slide to tell you how this gets proved. Uh, if I show you the next slide of how we proved most of these results, in fact, everything that's listed on these slides, you might get the feeling that, oh yeah, yeah, that's kind of easy. And maybe it is not so bad. So here is how this price, this scheme of how this gets proved. What you need to prove about the, the result, you, you're arguing something about inertia equilibrium. And in some high level, I really only have one thing to go for, and that's that inequality up, up there. Uh, I know that somehow these people don't want to switch to whatever they should be doing in the optimum. That's roughly all I know. I know that I know what I want them to do, which I point out that they don't know what I want them to do, but I do. I'm a designer. I know, hey, hey, that's the way you should do. And for some other reason, they don't want to do it. That is, the current cost is less than the cost of the optimum. And this is all we're going to end up using. And the class of games that we have been all using, but Tim Ruffgarden in a beautiful online paper summarized as a smoothness style proofs, says that if a game has the following interesting or weird looking property, then uh, it has a good price of energy. And I wrote down the inequality. It says that for any solution A, if I do something super weird on the left hand side, and some of the costs of every player as they single handedly change to the optimum while everyone else stays at their current solution, and I sum up those costs, then I have an inequality that connects that to the optimum cost and the current cost. Don't worry about the form of it. I'll, I'll tell you in a second what you should mean. If you have this inequality, which he termed the smoothness inequality, then uh, it's easy to see that Nash equilibrium has high quality because, well, remember, they don't want to switch to this solution, so clearly they cost is better than this. And dropping out the middle term, I now have an inequality connecting the left and the right. All I have to do is rearrange it, and I get an inequality. And that is the bound we have. Um, you could say that this band was designed to make the proof easy, and there is some truth in this. Or maybe backwards, this form was recognizing that this is what we're doing all the time. There are many, many papers predating Tim's paper by 10 years or over the 10 years before it that basically use this framework without being as good as he is in recognizing that there's a framework here. One way to phrase what he's saying, and I think that's maybe my favorite way of phrasing it, that what this inequality says is that if our current solution is really, really bad, much, much bigger than the opt, look at that inequality. If cost A is significantly above the optimum cost, that is, if I look this lambda times opt plus the cost, it's very heavily dominated on cost of A, then I can do something good. One of these guys switching to his optimum will improve the situation. It's not Nash, because someone will want to switch. That's what this inequality really says. OK, I went through this proof. I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, and I guess maybe not worth going through the slides again. But these are all the price of energy proofs I, sh I showed you are all based on this scheme. Um, I put in a, one comment here before I go and switch to the learning, which is what I really wanted to talk about. that. If you want to design a great game, a super great game, then maybe this price of energy bands that I'm proving here, which maybe I have to go back to, sorry, that slide, which says price of energy bands on the small numbers, one and a half, two, you can say that, well, 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 wait a minute. If I can help everyone get you know, twice as fast to their destination, I wish to do that. Very true. These are not optimal bands. And sometimes we do have better bands. Sort of the classical bands are this small constant range that is not close to one, but not in the hundreds. You know, one, two, one and a half, stuff like that. This is in contrast to this. Some games, there is what's called 
tragedies. And the classical example is the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons, we, without going through the details, is a game in which we all get to graze our cows on a patch of grass. And at the Nash equilibrium, uh, there will be a million cows and not enough grass, and all our cows will starve or will be the verge of starvation. That is, there is good welfare to be had in the system, but for some reason, selfishly, we ruin it. Tragedy of the commons is full in life, is examples with tragedy of the commons, uh, certainly environmental damage, uh, is a common example of tragedy of the commons. Actually, some traffic routing is an example. Congestion sometimes can be an example of the tragedy of the commons. So there are examples where selfish behavior can, ban, can cause unlimited damage. The fact that it's a, a small constant factor, I view, is a good thing, or at least not as bad. This? Sorry, maybe I should go through this slower. I exactly mean yes. Cost is something should be low at Nash equilibrium. So what we know at the cost of I is the second line here. A is a Nash equilibrium. Then your cost at A is less than any other action, this A star. A star is the optimum cost, the one that the social designer wants you to do. And as you have seen in the Brace Paradox example, the social designer might want you to do something that quote good for you, but it's not equilibrium, right? The A star is what the social designer would want you to do. That's socially good. Overall, it's good, but it's not an Nash equilibrium, or may not be an Nash equilibrium. A is the Nash equilibrium here, and I'm going to keep that notation. Star goes for the socially optimal thing, which might be good for all of us, certainly good as a collective, but it's not necessarily good individually for you, or in the brace paradox example, even individually it was good for you. What was really wrong is that once myopic objective function, it seemed like I can improve my situation by driving differently, or I could improve it temporarily while the other people didn't discover it yet. Does that make sense? OK, so now comes the question. So this is all happened maybe in the last 15, 20 years. There's a lot of research on this, and I'm happy to talk more as long as you all want. But I wanted to focus on learning, connecting this to learning and learning from data. So to ask that question, you can ask, wait, 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 Nash equilibrium. What was Nash equilibrium? And what does it really mean? So Nash is an outcome of selfish behavior, is common standard knowledge, certainly in economic circles, is an accepted fact that people find the Nash equilibrium. But if you start asking economists, as well as all the rest of us, can certainly understand and ask questions, wait, 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 we don't really understand this. So here are some of these questions. Nash equilibrium in most games is not unique. There are multiple Nash equilibria. How did people know which one? How did they find which one? A second, this is where uh, the large games come in. Remember, my games consisted all of you reading and your packets on the internet. That's a lot of you. How does one read router have enough information about all of us reading and other routers? I mean, we are sitting in front of other computers and reading packages from other places in the internet. There is no way a single router would have enough information to know this. So there is an informational problem. A single player in a game simply doesn't know all the things that are going on. And a simple player in the routing game, whether your car, or even including the radio news, or uh, a router, doesn't have enough memory and bandwidth to even start memorizing all these other things. So there's a lot of information needed. And then, if you're a computer scientist, 
or maybe even if you're not a computer scientist, there is a computational difficulty. As proven more recently by Daskalakis, Goldberg, and Papa Dimitriou, uh, finding Nash equilibrium in many games is computationally hard. So if it's computationally hard, then how did these simplistic routers or people find it? That's going to be a little difficulty here. If it's computationally hard to find, we won't be able to find it. So something's wrong with the Nash equilibrium notion. So what I want to do today is switch and instead think about what if they didn't find the Nash equilibrium, they're just learning. Um, now, learning has been a really, really classical topic in game theory. And let me actually start with um, a couple of proposals of what, how, how may, this m might all start. So when we started to think about V, meaning the CS econ community, about this online games and online auction, then maybe the first proposal was that, no, what's really going on here is that somehow magically by the uh, invisible hand of Adam Smith or the economy, we somehow magically found this equilibrium because this equilibrium is stable. And what's really going on is when we repeat the game, this equilibrium repeats over and over and over again. As you see on this slide, A1, A1 up to A in the second period, we do the same thing because we reached the Nash equilibrium and no one wants to deviate from this. We know how to drive to work to be fastest and everyone is happy with the current solution. So what that means, is this inequality on the bottom here. Your cost, the, again, A is your current solution, is smaller than any other cost you could have had. It's a Nash equilibrium, so you're happy with it. You know everyone else will drive the same way tomorrow, so you continue to be happy with it. So I'm going to call this the no regret condition. You're not regretting what you did so far because you know, there's nothing better you could do. Um, and then you can look at data, and I guess my data came from uh, Microsoft Bing auction. So Bing is Microsoft version of Google in case you're not using it. Uh, <laughs> and they too make a fair amount of money on this. And uh, they were willing to share some of the data. And this is what the uh, bidding on the auction looks like. This is a weak verse of data and I have a bunch of one particular keyword. I have a bunch of these. Uh, what it's not looking like is a stable solution. It's not stable. Something is changing. You can decide what this looks like to you. To me, it looks like they're running some sort of simple gradient descent style optimization algorithm. And therefore, changing their bits down, and some of them going down, some of them going up. I can show you other plots where it goes up for a while and then goes down again. Um, they gradually adjusting they, they think. And uh, that's, I think, what they really are doing. Um, so I want to propose that what they're doing is trying things and learning. And these, these auctions, as much as traffic routing also, is an ideal situation of trying and learning. Because a single auction or a single packet on the internet really doesn't matter. You can lose it, it's just, you can resend it, no problem. A single auction, it's a couple of cents, you lose it, you gain it, doesn't matter. You can experiment and try to learn from the data. And I think that's sort of what these guys are doing. Um, learning, when it started in, in studying game theory, and that was uh, a while back, um, actually asked a different question. Can they learn to find the Nash equilibrium? And I guess originally it was sort of as a form of pre-play. Pre-play was uh, maybe we can play a game before we run the auction so that we find the Nash equilibrium. Um, this was maybe the first influential paper here is by Julia Robinson. What's interesting about Julia Robinson is that it's a woman and she was the first uh, woman member of the National Academy of Sciences, which is maybe a nice thing to point out about her. She's a mathematician. This is her only foray in game theory. Um, but maybe I think this is what she's most famous for. Uh, what's fictitious play is best responding to the behavior of past players. So I watch what happened. I somehow believe, kind of magically, not quite true, that what, they, what they're not going to move, they're just going to repeat what they did the last many times. So I think of their behavior as random samples from a distribution, and I take what's best for me. And she was thinking of this as a pre-play, as a way 
it's not a real play. It's a way to find the Nash equilibrium. And she proved, uh, what did she prove? Um, she wondered whether it finds a Nash equilibrium. She proved that in two person zero sum games, it works. Later on, it was also proven that two by two games, even if it's not zero sum, it still works. It's find the Nash equilibrium. But it turns out that's about it. That's about the only class of games where this kind of thing will find the Nash equilibrium. Um, now, what do I want to do? I want to think of something simple like this, almost like this. You look at the past and try to learn from the past, which is certainly what fictitious play does. Uh, I maybe want to be a little more generous, just not pretend that the guy is not doing anything. So I'm a little bit better learning. And I, what I want to model is this. I want to model something of the form that when you start playing, you might be literally clueless. I have no idea. But somehow you get better over, over time and you learn something from the data. What can you hope to learn? So here is one thing that turns out to be completely reachable. And in addition to telling you what one can say about when you reach it, I also want to spend a couple of times convincing you that this is reachable. I can reach my no regret condition without the stability. So no regret condition, remember, said that my current solution is better than any other solution behind any other, so other solution x. This is my going to be my general no regret condition. Instead of saying that I stabilize and find the current solution that's better than any solution with hindsight, I want something a bit more relaxed. You don't have to find a single solution. You can alternate. But if there is a really good solution, x, that is really consistently very good, you should please find that. That is the condition I want. You can change your solution as often as you feel. So therefore, I index my a with time. a t is what other players do at time t. And I sum this over time. That's, I guess, roughly your average cost. I compare it to a fixed solution with hindsight. If there is a fixed solution, it's driving on root whatever, 101 in, in Silicon Valley, turns out to be such a good idea that it's consistently better than your alternatives. Please notice it. And that way it would reach this condition. If, if Highway 101 is not consistently good, sometimes good, sometimes not good, then it's hard to know when it's good and when it's not good. So it's harder. that's a harder condition. But this one just says, if there's one solution x that's consistently very good, please do at least as well as that one. Because you reach it by learning, I allow you to have a low error there, which I'm going to call regret. But I'm hoping that regret is, doesn't grow linearly with time. And in fact, there's very simple algorithms that make the, the regret go uh, uh, square root, that is significantly less fast than linearly with time. I can even convince you that these algorithms that do this are supernatural, very simple algorithms. And maybe we're spending a slide just to get you feel good about it. It's almost the same as the fictitious play I told you. Fictitious play was just best response to the past. And I says, no, well, that's a little drastic. Don't, you know, who knows? How about this? Just randomize a bit. So what fictitious play did is chose the, oops, this is on utilities, not on cost, sorry. Uh, chose this thing that was best historically. That is, chose the single action that's best historically. And now what I'm saying instead, and that's what smoothed here means, just make it a bit more, if there's a teeny difference, don't make such a big difference in your action. Add, a, add randomness when you can. Use randomness to the extent it's reasonable. More concretely, uh, try to choose a distribution uh, maximizing the same objective function but adding a little, little bit of noise. What I did is add the um, uh, entropy, add a little bit of entropy. When possible, keep it random. When one distribution, one, one's action is a lot better than the other, then do that. But if it's not a lot better, then a little entropy, add a little entropy. Entropy is good for you. That is, keep it random. If two are similarly good, then do them with similar probabilities. And turn out that this version of fictitious version of called smooth fictitious play works very well. It, I can also tell you, and maybe I'll skip this, of 
uh, what it turns out to be as an algorithm if you work out the mathematics, but I'll skip this. Um, and it generates what I, I promised you, a uh, square root of t, this regret growing sublinearly, that is as, as time, not linearly in time, but just square root of t. This is one of the many algorithms. If you add entropy, you can add any other regular, what's called regularizer, some sort of randomness, and it will take care of it. This is good in optimizing the speed at which uh, regret, go, regret goes down. Uh, there are many other algorithms that work really well. So this is what I want to define as learning. You learned if you did at least as well as very, every single action with hindsight. Or similarly, not much regret. Um, this is a condition that's achievable. This is a condition that I think humanly reasonable. I kind of believe people learn this well, and I'll come back to this in one second. In fact, many of us learn better than this. It's possible that doing something different on Mondays than on Tuesdays is good for you. And maybe you'll discover that too. I didn't ask you to discover that fact. Maybe, and you can discover it. Sure, that's even better. That is, regret is not necessarily a positive quantity. You have negative regret if you beat this benchmark, which you're welcome to do. What I'm asking you as a learner, what I'm hoping people achieve, is that they meet this benchmark. They might beat it, or they at least should meet it. Um, what happens in a game when people reach this benchmark? So the original Julia Robinson question was, will they reach an ash equilibrium? And now we know that the answer to this has to be no. This is an algorithm, a very, very simple algorithm. And we know that finding Nash equilibrium is computationally hard, so a simple algorithm can do it. I know it because Daskalakis, Papa Dimitri, sorry, Daskalakis, Goldberg, and Papa Dimitri proved it. It's computationally hard, and therefore this algorithm is incapable of doing this. Um, but it reaches something else, and what something else it reaches is called correlated equilibrium. So what does it reach? It reaches a probability distribution of our play that exactly has the Nash equilibrium property. I, I assumed that they're going to reach, and the limit, with regret going to zero, they're going to reach the equilibrium condition. Every, whatever I did over the past is better than any single action with hindsight. That's exactly my condition. I assume they learn this way, and it's learnable that way. This is precisely Nash equilibrium. Well, almost. Here is what we're missing. We're becoming correlated. That this is what's called a correlated equilibrium. What's correlated equilibrium is the exact same as Nash equilibrium, except our place might become correlated. So if, say, the two of us are playing this game, then what can happen is the two of us um, don't act independently as we should in Nash equilibrium. What are we correlating on? We're correlating on past history. We're sharing the history. We're learning on the same history. And therefore, we're correlating. And I guess uh, to, this is maybe a nice and maybe important concept. So I wanted to actually really, really drive home what I mean here and try that on a two-player simple example that probably you guys all know, rock, paper, scissor. So this is the payoff matrix for rock, paper, scissor. Uh, R, P, and S for rock, paper, scissor. Uh, you win if you, zero if you on the diagonal, one if you beat the other person. What happens? So first of all, what's the Nash equilibrium of this game? I guess we all know that Nash equilibrium here is to completely randomize uniformly, play one third, one third, one third. By the way, we also know that this is really hard for humans, and they're actually cool uh, rock, paper, scissor human competition with people winning trophies for actually being able to beat uh, rock, paper, scissor. And if you're not convinced that this is hard for humans, then try that. There is an old New York Times app. I think if you Google rock, paper, scissor, New York Times, you get it, uh, where you can play against an algorithm that the New York Times put up for us. Um, I lose, and I bet you guys all lose. <laughs> And no, I mean, you probably don't have to lose if you cheat. If you actually really flip coins, yes, you can do it. There is nothing they can do. They non magically read what you're going to do. Instead, if you don't cheat, that is, you actually try to randomize in a head with no randomization device, 
then apparently they can figure out what you do, and they can beat you. Uh, OK, but let's figure out what happens if we do learning. And to make our game a little bit more interesting, I actually changed the payoff from zero sum to putting a ni minus 9 on the diagonal. Uh, that doesn't change the equilibrium. It's still one third, one third, one third, but it's now not a zero sum game. And remember, Julia Robinson proved to us that zero sum games are different, so now it's not. It's not a zero sum game. Uh, I can drive the equilibrium, uh, what we're playing or what I'm playing, one player does. I can represent it in a 2D picture because there's three strategies here, but you probably just have to sum to one, so we're really in 2D. And so this is the picture, the corner side, you're playing scissor, rock, or paper. And the green dot is the mixed Nash equilibrium, one third, one third, one third. And I try to imagine what will happen if we play, if, say, I play against you, and say, I start playing uh, the mixed strategy, and you're trying to learn. Maybe you start on the mixed Nash equilibrium, too, who knows? Now, the thing is, randomization is not ideal, and you're welcome to quote it and try it out. As it turns out, when you do a 1,000 runs, you probably will be over one of them you do a bit too often. Say it, one thing is called paper. Maybe I do paper a little more often. If I do paper a bit too often, what will happen is your learning algorithm will pick up on the fact that I did paper a bit too often. And as a result, you do scissor a bit too often to which my learning algorithm picks up on the fact that, hey, he's doing scissor all the time. I should pick up on that. And I do rock all the time. And what we're doing in this 2D picture is a spiral behavior on which we're going to chase each other rather than staying in the center as an Akash equilibrium. Uh, or uh, illustrated on the picture, we're going to play the off-diagonal entries without paying the diagonal entries or without heavily paying the diagonal entries. That is, our behavior got correlated. When I'm doing rock, then my opponent is seemingly equally likely to do paper or scissor, but not doing rock. We're avoiding the diagonal, which is cool in this example because the diagonal had the minus nines. Um, so this is what correlated equilibrium is. It correlates the behavior in a weird kind of way. Um, OK. So I have only a few minutes left, or actually, how many minutes? Ten. Ten, ten, ten minutes left. So I want to tell you something about two, putting two pieces together that I sort of gave you a high level view so far. Uh, one started with Nash equilibrium, quality of Nash equilibrium, and the second I showed you when some sense of when they're learning, they're going to find this correlated equilibrium instead of finding a real equilibrium, a pure Nash equilibrium. So first thing I want to tell you is correlated equilibrium is actually turns out is equally good for this price of energy results. So uh, actually, I'll skip this. And maybe even skip the following slides, which I guess to the speed of time, I guess one line of research uh, that involved uh, this, my colleagues and students at Cornell, we are trying to wonder about how fast you converge into this correlated equilibrium. And in fact, we can show that the convergence is faster than the root t that you would expect. But I'm going to skip this because I want to get to the second part. Uh, what I really want to more spend my last 10 minutes on is the quality of learning outcome in, in games. So remember, going back to the quality that we talked about in the beginning, we had this, um, no, I guess this is learning outcome. OK, maybe I skip this too. I, OK, sorry. There's a little insert here that maybe we're talking about to what extent people are learning. There's a bunch of different papers, including my paper uh, with Denis Nakipolov and, and Vasily Sirkanis, uh, thinking about different setups and wondering whether learning is a reasonable model of human behavior. Uh, maybe uh, the one that's nice to point out is the very top one, uh, which is a human subject experience, and the very bottom one, which is the Bing uh, auction data. They're very different domains. One case, the lower case, our work is on algorithmic bidders, that these are big 
companies that using algorithmic machine learning tools to bid, and the top one was human subject experience. And they both of them uh, reasonably well uh, match the regret behavior. But due to focusing on the next part, I want to get to this quality of outcomes. So let's actually go back to the quality of outcomes and remind you that we talked about this price of energy, which was the cost of Nash equilibrium compared to the optimal cost. So that was the price of energy that I already talked about in the beginning. The natural generalization that I maybe want to focus on is when they're learning. So what would learning mean? Learning would mean, I think, one of the two things, this and the next one up. This one would say, the cost of the solution, the average cost of solution you reached, compared to some optimum, as time goes to infinity, if you learn long enough. Okay, I sum up your cost, uh, divide by t, that's your average cost, compared to the optimum cost. This is a bit not realistic, um, and maybe a bit, you know, fantasy, because this assumed that the optimum solution is not changing. There's no changing population, everything is very stable. So what I really want, and this is our recent paper, um, is I want this, which is maybe too high a price, but I wonder what conditions can I get something like this. The average cost that you paid compared to the average cost of the optimum. That is, I allow the optimum to change also. And this is my real goal. And what I want to do in the last 10 minutes is give you a little favor that putting together the two pieces I already told you, we're almost there, and I can convince you that, oh yeah, this is very doable. I hope so. I hope I can, 10 minutes will be plenty enough to do this. So step number one, I have to step back and just think about learning outcomes, learning, and no regret condition. And again, I have to skip one of the convergence things here. Oh, shit. Okay. Okay, let's do what happened here. Okay. Uh, what do we have? This slide is a bit too focused on the speed of convergence, which I'm skipping, but I can still tell you the price of energy part using these slides. So what is the no regret condition we have? The no regret condition says that you don't regret any single things with hindsight. If it was a consistently good solution, you not regret that. Um, what do I want you to not regret? Just the same thing I always wanted you to not regret. I wanted you to not regret the optimal solution with hindsight. So I use the same A star I always had. That's what the social designer wants you to do, and I want you to not regret that condition. And if I use this condition that you not regret it, I end up with the very same chain of inequalities I always used to have using the smoothness condition um, and end up with the very same band on your average cost compared to this opt, which is in the smoothness inequality. So what's nice about the smoothness star proofs, and that indeed was Tim's point when he pointed out the property, it's not only about equilibrium, it's about the no regret condition. As long as you have the no regret condition, whether you're equilibrium or not, you do have the price of energy band. You can chain the two inequalities together. Um, you get a little deterioration because of the regret error, which is what's getting pointed at. Uh, but as a final piece, somehow something was very uh, non-satisfying in that proof because it assumed in a painful way that the population or the optimum is unchanging. There's a single strategy with hindsight, this A star, that's not changing as you go, and it's always the same optimum, and that's the thing you should not regret. So what would happen if I take a dynamic population, which is much more realistic, where people come and go, um, you repeat the game, but um, the strategies are a bit changing. So this is a paper by Todoris Likoris and, and Vasily Sirkanis, and myself more recently. Uh, and what we're doing as an actual concrete model is take a population of games and every iteration, every player will vanish with some small, small probability p. What you should think of is that in expectation everyone stays in p inverse time, so I'm going to make that long enough that they can learn. At the same time, 
uh, with n players, and think of n as big, n times p people change all the time, so the optimum moves like crazy, or at least often, because the population, always someone's leaving, but you stay long enough that you're capable of learning, or any one person is capable of learning. To make something work out here, I have to be a little bit more careful with my learning, because players might have to slightly adopt these strategies. If you think of this player in this particular, I don't know if it's a traffic writing or what kind of game, He's choosing between the red and, red and yellow option. Maybe when he came, then red was very busy and he wasn't used to choose the yellow. But as time goes on, these red guys all vanished and maybe he needs to switch over to switch his strategy. So I need them to run a sort of adaptive version of the learning algorithm uh, that adapts with time. And I guess I uh, maybe was too optimistic on what fits in an R. But you can have these algorithms adopt. All they have to do, again, summarizing only in plain English, is a bit forgetful. That is, recent experience is more relevant than very far away ones, because maybe some people left since then. But one trouble that I do want to emphasize, and that's sort of the last technical piece of what I was hoping to say, is if I really, really just want to copy over the proof, then I will wish for something that's not hopeful. So this is what I would wish to hope. I wish to have that your cost, as you went over time and things changed over the other players, is, is good compared to the optimum cost with hindsight. Where now optimum itself changed also. So the one thing that changed in this slide, that the optimum may start got time indexed because the optimum changes. Now this is too hard. The optimum, as I said, the population changing, the optimum is changing. You can't possibly, on the universe, have an optimal that you can learn this well. If every single iteration you should do something else, then how did you learn that? So learning cannot achieve this. But uh, here is something, so optimum can be very sensitive, as probably you all know, but in case you don't, here's a simple matching example. It's an optimum solution. Uh, one guy vanishes, the optimum solution totally changes. It's an augmenting pass with arbitrary number of changes in it. So changes are really big. Um, however, uh, the learning players can adopt to changes with uh, some amount of changes. Unfortunately, maybe not surprisingly, the regret, the error term, will be linear in the number of changes they have to tolerate. Not too surprisingly, if there are a lot of changes, it's going to get worse. Uh, but turns out this is good enough, and what you need is a theorem of some sort that I won't go into details, but maybe many of you do optimization will believe me that, oh yeah, I guess that could be possible. Uh, in a large enough game, it's often the case that you can have a not quite optimal, but close to optimal solution that's stable, that has the property that is not too sensitive when you take one or, one or two people out. To give you some sense, uh, in a matching case, turns out the greedy matching is a lot more stable than the optimal matching, just as an example. And there are many other cases when we can do uh, stable solutions. And I guess to summarize our theorem in a very high level way, in many, many games where Nash equilibrium has this smoothness style price of energy proof, we can extend it to uh, working with, with changing population. Uh, the price of energy with the changing population will not be so great, so I guess we call it with three different parameters, alpha, beta, and gamma. Let me explain what they are. Alpha is the original price of energy band, which if I want to be careful when I make the game big enough, that can go to one. Gamma is a regret loss, depending how long I'm keeping people in the game. So if the probability of change is small, then gamma goes to one, but otherwise that's something. It's a regret loss. They're not learning well enough. And finally, there is a beta. Beta is how much I lost from the optimum because I wanted the stability. Again, if the game is really big, beta can go to one, two. Big games, um, people staying long enough, there is no price of energy. If the game isn't that big, then there's different parameters that quantifies the price of energy. Again, uh, in the, the beauty here is these are all constant, relatively small constants. Uh, not in the not deteriorating with the number of players. So to wrap up, um, there are a couple high-level messages and maybe some more technical messages. I hope you guys all agree 
that learning is a good, interesting way to analyze in game. It might be a good way to actually adapt to opponent. Unlike what I said about Nash, you don't, know, don't need to know who the opponent is and what the hell they're doing. So no need to have any prior knowledge about the opponent. And actually, one feature I didn't mention and not in this work is if the opponent plays badly, learning algorithms take advantage of the opponent making mistakes, whereas Nash equilibrium does not. Um, on a third technical part, in some games and auctions and traffic routing are two examples. Uh, learning players reach a high social welfare, and they can do so even in dynamically changing environment, depending on various parameters. So learning is good for social welfare, and maybe good for individual welfare also in two different parts. And thank you very much for your uh, attention. I, I will repeat the question, so as long as I hear it, it's fine. The, uh, I, I heard it, I'm not so sure I understand, but let me try and you can, you can clarify the question if I misunderstood it. What are the, some of the common mistakes I come across when uh, designing or analyzing a game. And somehow it seems to me like there are two questions here, designing and analyzing. So some of, one of some of these things um, are like traffic routing is really analyzing, not designing. That is, I did make the assumption, which I think is sort of correct, that routers want to get the packets to the destination fast. Um, I guess, um, the learning or even the smooth, the smooth like sort of um, smooth behavior uh, is something that traffic writers have been doing years before I started to look at it. In fact, probably before I was born. Uh, these are things that were happening and all we are doing is analyzing it, not designing it. Uh, and then one issue in the analyzing category or two issues in the analyzing category that's common, if you look at a some game, there are many tragedy of the commons out there. That there are many games where uh, there are bad Nash equilibria, or actually versions where there are some equilibrium are good and some equilibrium are bad. Uh, the games I showed you or talked about are games where all Nash equilibria have reasonably good properties. So those games at this point we understand pretty well. Uh, we understand much less, and maybe that's a form of mistake, games where some Nash equilibria are good and other Nash equilibria are bad. And what you really want to understand is uh, both two questions. Do people somehow know to find, does these learning algorithms will find the good ones or the bad ones? And if the answer to this is unclear, can I help them? Can I get them to find the good ones? Can I do anything to induce them to migrate towards the good solutions rather than the bad solutions. The second part is maybe your design question of what can I do uh, to design games. Uh, certainly the auction games are designed, so there is a lot of discussion in Google or Microsoft of exactly how should they run the auction. Uh, maybe many of you know about second price auction or even the generalized second price auction that's the classical auction for for Google, there's lots of interesting questions that is not quite this of exactly what they should do in a more modern, more flexible environment that's running today. That's a fully designed question. And then there is the sort of halfway. It's a natural game. I have a little bit of control. I can't, can't just design the game from the beginning. What would I do with my little control to help them reach a good outcome rather than a bad outcome? Um, these are very open questions. So. Um, I don't know if these are mistakes I come across, but these are certainly great research directions. Uh, mistakes one comes across is, especially if it's humans, uh, this took a very mathematical attitude of what people will do, selfishly optimizing the objective function. And one very interesting question is, most of us don't know what our objective function is, so we certainly are bad at optimizing it. 
So in many cases, uh, modeling uh, biased or interesting human behavior that's not as simple as minimizing delay or maximizing utility is, again, very open, very interesting, lots of great research. I, I hope I kind of answered what you tried to ask, but I'm not, OK. Sure. Uh, it's a great question, and maybe I should have paid more attention to this. If I think about uh, Google auction, that's a pretty full inform. Like, so one question is how much information people get, and I made it importantly that you shouldn't know who else is playing because that's really lots of information. For these algorithms, what you really need as a feedback is what your payoff would have been had you chosen another path. So in the traffic routing example, what you need as a feedback is when you choose to drive on 101, uh, again, using California because those roads maybe are more famous or because I know them better, uh, you need to know what was the delay on some other road, which at this point, Google or even the news does provide you with that form of full information. Um, so yes, what I actually, any band I showed assumed full information of this sort, that you always know what you could have gotten had you paid something else. Uh, the results do extend to partial information. So partial information would mean that when you drive on 101, you literally only know what happened on 101. You weren't on the other roads. You know nothing about those. Um, it definitely uh, slows down the speed of convergence because you're going to have to try these other things to learn anything about them. So the particular bands I offered for speed of convergence, that, those ones don't extend. You have to be, like you, you're losing a factor because of lack of information. But at the high level of what this converges to and how it depends on time, that, those stay the same. So yes, but I should be a little careful if there is no full information out there. Uh, another very open direction is the, both the full information and what's usually used as a bandit model, that you literally only know about things that you tried. Those are very well understood. I think the real life is somewhere in between. That is, when you drive on 101, uh, you really know what happened on 101, you were there. And you know something about the other ones because maybe you heard on the news or something. Uh, what you get on other things you didn't try is usually partial, less correct information, and that's a much more open area. Uh, but even with just the information on what you tried, we can regenerate some of these with the, with the convergence bands getting worse. Yeah, sure. Hmm. Uh, so I guess he's asking about this, this uh, one of these last slides here, this guy here. Yeah. But there are really two losses, the price of energy loss and the loss due to desired stability of the solution, so the alpha and beta in this example. Uh, and that there is something similar about them, and indeed something similar in the sense that both are going to one as the game gets larger. They're both helpful if there are a lot of players around that want similar thing that's really helpful in pushing those numbers close to one. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. It's, a, it's an interest, it's a good point, and certainly what helps those numbers be close to one is the same thing. Uh, I don't know if I'm good at, at, at uniting them beyond the fact that uh, many similar players or many players with similar goals are uh, really helpful in both cases. Uh, cool question. Uh, so the question was, can I trick players into thinking they have negative regret? Uh, and is it beneficial or ethical? Uh, it's certainly a cool direction, I guess. Uh, there is some sort of panel discussion that I gather some of us will do tomorrow, and I was thinking of raising the 
the, some of these more ethical or, or different sort of issues that I didn't raise here uh, because I don't know a mathematical answer. Like, I mean, certainly the last part of the question, is it ethical? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I don't have anything really smart other than, you know, all humans have like a panel discussion level things to offer. Uh, is it beneficial? Sure, it can be. I just showed you that if I could show in the Brace Paradox, the very first example, if I convinced the Brace Paradox I'm some, that please don't use that middle edge, that's bad. It, everyone is better off. Every single player is better off. And maybe if I can help everyone, that would be one place it's ethical to help them, though I, I'm not sure. I don't. Ethical, that's, that's a great, great question. Um, last I don't know, and maybe you have an idea, and I'm happy to talk to you offline, is, is what, do you, what does it even mean to, to, how can I cheat them? Like, I guess one way you can ask this question, and maybe that's something it's worth commenting on. When I said that the Google auction is, is full information, what Google does, or, or Microsoft also, if you bid in the auction, say you want some ad and you're willing to pay $5 for an ad, they give you, as a response, they give you a payoff curve. They not only tell you how many, how many, how many times they showed you your ad uh, because of the $5 and how much you have to pay, pay because of this, but instead they show you what would have happened had you bid other numbers. That is, they give you a curve of how the number of impressions that you would have won or number of times you would have been shown, and the, your cost would change with the bid. They give you a, a, a function. That's on their display. Um, now, one question is, do we trust them? That is, as a bidder, when you so see such a curve, do you really believe it's true? And we actually have a paper that I didn't even touch on here uh, looking at whether people trust, it, trust what they're getting here. And I don't know if, you know, I don't know why they don't trust. Google's telling me that those numbers are all correct. Uh, there is some sense that people don't trust them. Uh, whether it would be ethical, would they be, how, I, excellent questions. But there is certainly a trust issue. And certainly in that place, Google has a, has a way of cheating them. They could have given a different curve. I don't, I don't think they do, but I guess I don't know. <laughs>